In this video, we're going to define two important parameters for our star. It's age and rotation. At first glance, these two parameters seem to be a rather random and disparate pairing, but when it comes to stars, these two things are actually intrinsically linked. Like people, main sequence stars slow down as they age. This is due mainly to a phenomenon known as magnetic breaking, which happens when the star's magnetic field interacts with its stellar winds. But they also slow down due to mass ejection, stealing weight, angular momentum. Regardless of why it happens, this means that what we set our star's rotation to be will depend on its type and how old it is. How old your star should be depends on what type of inhabited planet you plan to place in its system. For settled and terraformed worlds, it can be nearly anything within the star's lifetime, but older than 100 million years is a good starting point as it gives your planets time to fully form and cool enough for liquid water to condense onto their surfaces. For an evolved world with complex multicellular life forms, i.e. the alien equivalent of flora, fauna, and fungi, it will need to be considerably older than this. How much older is difficult to say. On Earth, it took around 3 billion years for complex multicellular life to develop, but biologists are quick to point out that Earth shouldn't necessarily be used as a template, as evolution is not a straightforward process with predictable results and is highly influenced by environmental factors. So depending on its external conditions, evolution on an exoplanet may arrive at these milestones faster or slower than it did on Earth, if it does at all. The best I've been able to get from querying biologists about the minimum amount of time necessary to reach complex multicellular life is approximately 500 million years, assuming perfect circumstances. But needless to say, perfect circumstances are likely exceedingly rare. So the later into your star's lifespan you set its age, the more plausible and realistic it's going to seem. I'm going to play it very safe and set my star's age at about 4.15 billion years. Once you've chosen an age for your star, we need to make sure that it falls within the star's predicted main sequence lifespan. To do that, we can use this simplified equation, which relates the approximate age of your star in billions of years to 10 times the mass of your star in solar masses raised to the power of negative 2.5. Before we get to this calculation, there are a few things I need to point out about this equation. First, this applies only to main sequence stars. It cannot be used for any other class of star. And second, this is only an approximation. Anytime you see an equation this simple for a subject as complicated as stellar dynamics, you can be assured it's not going to be precise. This equation will be accurate to the billion year mark, but a little less so at the 100 million year mark, and even less so at the 10 million year mark. By the time you get to the 1 million year mark, it has lost all semblance of accuracy. And lastly, this equation works best with stars in the middle of the mass range. It tends to underestimate the lifespan of very low mass stars, which can actually live for over a trillion years, and it overestimates the lifespan of very high mass stars, which typically last less than 100 million years. But in those edge cases, it doesn't really matter. You're either dealing with a star that lives so long that its lifespan isn't a concern, or a star that has such a short lifespan that it's not likely to have planets anyway. That out of the way, let's pull up our calculator and enter 10 times the mass of our star in solar masses, my star's mass is 0 0.9064, and then we'll raise this to the power of negative 2.5. So your equation should look something like this. We can now press equals and get our star's estimated main sequence lifespan in billions of years. For me, that's about 12.7 billion years. Now there's no need to record this estimate, we just need to make sure that the chosen age of our star is within its main sequence lifespan. But now that I've confirmed that the age I chose for my star is valid, I'm going to add its age to my SAP sheet. While there is a method in astrophysics called gyrochronology that is used to determine the age of low mass stars based on their rotational velocities, it is, as you might expect, extremely complicated and way too much to deal with in this context. So. For the sake of simplicity, we're just going to try to get our star's rotation within the ballpark of plausibility. 
To do that, we can make use of this graph, which shows the rotational velocities of several hundred stars organized by their spectral type. Looking at the graph, it is clear that low-mass stars tend to have relatively slow rotational velocities, while high-mass stars can have comparatively fast rotational velocities and vary across a greater range. Chances are your star lies on the low mass end of this scale, so let's zoom in on that section of the graph. Here we have the rotational velocity, in kilometers per second, along the vertical axis and spectral type along the horizontal. The thin capped bars represent the range at which we find stars, while the thick bars are where we find the majority of the stars in this sample. And the blue lines are just the median values for the stars in that spectral type. Each one of these segments represents a different spectral type, with the white lines at the bottom marking the spectral type below. So, this chart gives us a good idea of what the valid rotational velocities are for the type of main sequence star we've chosen. Any value you choose within this range is going to be close enough to accurate to be considered realistic. But if we want to get even closer, we can recall that stars slow down as they age. So our star will likely start up near the top of its range and progress toward the bottom. But this isn't a linear progression. The rate of slowing is highest when the star is young and diminishes as the star ages and slows down. Which is why stars can approach, but never reach, a rotational velocity of zero. So armed with this knowledge, we can place our star at a point within the range that best matches the age we've defined for it. It appears I picked a spectral type with a very small range of rotational velocities, so I'm going to have to increase the precision of my numbers to have any room to move around. So I'm going to convert my units from kilometers per second to meters per second. It's a good idea to do this anyway, as meters per second is the SI unit for velocity, and it's always a good idea to keep all of our parameters in the same units, so equations always work out correctly. Best I can tell, my star's maximum rotational velocity is going to be around 8.5 kilometers per second. There are 1,000 meters in a kilometer, so that's 8,500 meters per second. Since my star is only about a quarter of the way through its main sequence lifespan, I'm going to estimate it to have progressed through about 45-46% of its range. So I'm going to pull up my calculator, type in my star's maximum rotational velocity as 8,500 meters per second, multiply by, in parentheses, 1 minus 0 0.4628, which is just the decimalized percentage of my star's main sequence that I have estimated to have passed, with some extra detail added onto the end of it. Pressing equals, I get 4,566 meters per second for my star's rotational velocity. Excellent. That out of the way, we can now calculate our star's rotation period using this equation, which is simply our star's circumference divided by its rotational velocity. So I'm going to go back to my calculator, open parentheses, and enter 2 pi times my star's radius which was calculated in an earlier video to be 631,575,985 meters. Close the parentheses and divide by my star's rotational velocity. Pressing equals, I get a value of 869,099 seconds. Once you have this huge number of seconds written down on your SAP sheet, we can convert it to days so that it's a bit more comprehensible. We do this by simply dividing this value by the number of seconds in a day, which is 86,400 seconds. That gives my star a rotation period of approximately 10 days. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this rotational velocity we defined was just for our star's equatorial region. But stars have differential rotation across their latitudes, meaning that their angular velocity changes usually reducing, the closer one measures to the star's poles. Within science fiction circles, this fact isn't usually important to anyone. About the only time something like this comes up in fiction is when a sunspot threatens to launch a flare or coronal mass ejection toward an orbiting planet. But since planets typically orbit close to the star's equatorial plane, the threatening sunspots would likewise need to be within the star's equatorial region, so the values we calculated would actually be the most appropriate to use. 
Since the values for this differential rotation are rarely needed and the equation to calculate them is somewhat complicated, I have chosen not to include it in this video. But if you happen to need these values, drop me a comment and I'll try to walk you through it. Before we go, there is one more optional parameter you can get if you want it. That is the star's rotation rate. This is going to be an either degrees per second or, if you want to be really scientific, radians per second. If you want it in degrees per second, you simply take 360 and divide by your star's rotation period, in seconds of course. If you want it in radians, it's just 2 pi divided by the star's rotation period. 